This is Jay Richards with the Discovery Institute, and we're here at the COSM 2019 conference, and I'm joined by uh, economist Gail Pooley, who is a professor at BYU Hawaii. Yes, the BYU has a campus in Hawaii on Oahu, and he gets to teach there. Um, and we're actually gonna talk about what he was talking about earlier today at the conference. Uh, Gail, first of all, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Um, and a bunch of us, including George Gilder, who I know is a big fan of your work, has been following the development uh, of this, this Simon Abundance Index that you have developed with Marion Tupi at the Cato Institute. And it's kind of a new way of measuring the increase in wealth and abundance. But first of all, what were, what were we hoping to do with the, the Simon Abundance What we were trying index? to do is, is the, uh, we were, the question we were asking is, is the, wor is the uh, earth kind of running out of stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, we see in the media today that this kind of constant, we're running out, we're using up, we shouldn't have children. Yes, uh, using up all the resources. Yeah, we're using up everything and we're, we're, we've kind of got this uh, crisis mode. And, and this uh, mode has is, is been in our culture for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of went back to, to the 1980s and said, you know, we had a, a, a discussion about this in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that discussion, there was a wager made between Paul Ehrlich, who was the advocate that look, we're gonna, if we have more people, yep. we're gonna, we're gonna run out of stuff. Population all prices, bomb, right. all this, all these predictions. And the prices are gonna skyrocket. Yep. And there was an economist that kind of said, you know, I, I don't think so. And that uh, was Julian Simon. Julian Simon said, look, I'm. Uh, first of all, what was interesting about mm -hmm. Julian Simon, he reads Ehrlich's book, right. and he initially agreed with it. He said, you know, mm -hmm. your theories, uh, it looks like it's straight math. Straight math. Yeah. Uh, and he said, you know, but I'm an economist, I should go look at my data. And, and the more that he looked at this data, he said, you know, we're not running out. In fact, what the data is indicating is we're, we're becoming more and more abundant. And so they had this discussion through the 70s, and finally in the early 1980s, uh, Simon finally said to Ehrlich, why don't we bet? And the consequence of that bet was that uh, Ehrlich had to pay Simon $576 because the prices had fallen of these five non-renewable metals. Mm -hmm. Which Ehrlich picked, right? Ehrlich so Simon picked said, you pick, the, yeah. you pick these, uh, these commodities, which were you metals. You pick the five metals, yep. copper, chromium, nickel, tin, and tungsten, and let's see what happens for mm -hmm. the next 10 years. Right. And Ehrlich said, fantastic, you know, I'd love to take your money. And uh, at the end of 10 years, they had fallen by 36% in real terms. Okay, so this is, uh, of course, really counterintuitive initially, yeah. right? Because, of course, there's a fixed volume to the earth, obviously, right? It's got a fixed area. And so presumably there's a fixed amount of gold and tungsten and all these things. And so um, wh what for Simon, wh what's happening? I mean, this idea that, you know, it, it seems sort of intuitive. The more yeah. people you have eating more stuff, breathing more air, drinking more water, the more of that finite amount of yeah. stuff that you're gonna use up. I mean, what, what, what did Simon think was happening? Simon said, yeah, for every person that's born, we add another mouth. Mm -hmm. But we also add two hands and we add, what, 10 trillion brain cells. Yeah. And, and that ability to be able to create uh, and turn things that are just here into resources. Mm. And once again, there's nothing that's a natural resource. Sure. We got things out there and they, they become a resource, they become valuable when we have human intelligence that's applied to that thing. Mm -hmm. And Simon was able to see this because he was looking at all of these non-renewable metals and they kept getting cheaper and cheaper. And he says, how could that be? How could it be if we have a fixed number of atoms of right. copper that they're getting cheaper? If, if they're really running out, they should be going up. Absolutely, in price. it's prime demand. Yeah. yeah. So he has this he has this idea that you know there's something that's explaining it. Uh, okay. We're not getting more atoms. What yeah. we're getting is we're getting the ability to make these atoms smarter, find them, make them smarter. That ability far exceeded the ability of populations to increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so more people, more creators. Right, exactly. Essentially. And so, so now tell me about the Simon Abundant in, Abundance Index, which you obviously named after Julian Simon. What have you and Mary yeah. Tupi done with that? So what we, you know, we just, we really liked what Julian had done. One, he was one guy that stood up and said, hey, this is, yes. there's an issue here. So we really respected his kind of integrity and courage mm -hmm. at the time. And then he wins the bet, you know, which we're happy about. And then a lot of people at the time just said, you know, he, he was lucky or it was only right. for 10 years. Yeah, the timing. So, yeah. you know, looks look, so we said, well, let's extend it from five uh, items to 50 items. So mm -hmm. we add food to it, we add energy to it, we add materials to it. Right. So we get this index that's got 50 foundational commodities, and then we go from 1980 when the original bet was, and we just go to 
go to today. So it's a 38 year uh, period of analysis. Okay. And then the second thing we did is we said, you know, we, we, we're not just going to look at the prices and try to adjust them for mm -hmm. inflation. We felt like a, a more appropriate uh, way would be to say, when innovation occurs, it's true that prices will go down. Right. But the other thing that innovation does is that is it, uh, we see it show up in higher incomes. Mm -hmm. So people make more money. If a, yeah, if a company sure. innovates something, they make profit. Well, what can we do this with this? Well, we could give our employees more income. Yeah. We could try to get more market share by lowering prices. We mm -hmm. could give our uh, shareholders a dividend. There's lots of things that you could do if you're innovating yes. with, that, with that profit. So if you look at a price of things and then you divide it by hourly income, you're capturing the innovation on the income okay. as well as the price decline, uh, the innovation that happens in the price decline. And so we call that the time price. Okay. And this is the key thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, so, so explain this. What's the idea of a time price intuitively? So for someone that's not sort of used to okay. looking at the yeah, economic charts. So let's go back uh, to the year 2000 mm -hmm. and say, what did it cost you uh, to buy a gallon of gas? Oh, it was $2 a gallon. Well, how much were you earning per hour in the year 2000? Hmm. Well, I'm earning $6. Well, what's that ratio? That ratio will tell you how much time it took you to earn the money to buy that gallon of gas. So it's a gallon of gas bought in 1980 versus a gallon of gas bought compared and right. determined by how much of your time is used or needed right. in order to buy that. So okay. it's two ratios. Here's the gas price in 1980. Here's mm -hmm. how much you were earning in 1980. Right. And that tells us that's how many hours it took you to yes. buy that gas. Now let's fast forward and say, today, here's the price, but here's how much you're earning. Mm -hmm. What's that ratio? And then we compare those two ratios. Okay, so what's the trend? Well, the trend has been, uh, <laughs> for these 50 uh, foundational commodities, is the trend is the price, the time price has dropped about 70%. Wow. <laughs> yeah, with, with uh, zinc dropped about 22%. Uh, Uranium has dropped 87%. That's oil, astonishing. crude oil has yeah. dropped about 60%, 62%. Astonishing. Yeah, so I think part of it is, and then the next thing is, wow, all these time prices are going down. How does that compare back to Simon and Ehrlich's bet, yes. which was tied to population? Because mm -hmm. the model, their, their argument was the price of the resources and population both. Is right. there a relationship between those two? Yes, and so how does it work on the Simon Abundance Index? Well, yeah, so 1980, from 1980 to today, we've gone from 4.5 billion to 7.6 billion. Mm -hmm. So we've increased over 3 billion. It's about a 70% increase in population. At the same time, you have a 70% decrease in prices. Wow. Time prices. So one of the findings that we, uh, kind of conclusions we were able to make is, it looks like every time you increase population 1%, your time prices go down 1%. And it's not, the other important thing to understand yes. is a price increase is not the same as a price decrease. Mm -hmm. So as you're The way percentages work. I right. know this, yeah, it's, it's one of these SAT right. tricks. Yes. Right, negative percentages yeah. are like, okay, I gotta uh, be careful here because yes. I, I, as I start, because prices can only drop 100%, right. then they're free. But the, but the ratio of that, or one divided by that, can go to infinity. Yes. So we start seeing these prices drop, and when they get in the 50, 60, 70% range, the abundance just goes, it goes wow. exponential. And so it, we it just, this is, seems to me to be a better way to measure what's actually happening, because some of our sort of old ways of measuring economic growth from the 20th century, I think in some ways, we just don't quite capture everything that's right. happening. That's what we're I think failing, is exciting. We, we felt like there, we're failing to capture the full effect of innovation because we're mm -hmm. not measuring it, we're not, comparing prices to income. Okay. It's that ratio that you've got to watch. Yeah. We, okay. we, we, we felt. Okay, so there's, so here's the, the controversial question is it's kind of the metaphysical question. So why is this? How is this ultimately that more human beings, rather than just being mouths that can consume, which seems intuitive to people like Paul Ehrlich, right. and I think an increasing number of educated Americans more or less think this, right? So what needs to be true about the human person? What's really happening in your view that, that makes this possible? Well, this key is our advance, uh, our ability to advance as human beings is based on this uh, ability to innovate. Mm -hmm. Come up with a new way of doing something, more for less. Can I do this in a new way that allows us to actually have more abundance? And that ability to innovate uh, is a function of our freedom to 
invent, right. which is really the result of our ability to have ideas. Mm -hmm. Are we free to have ideas and then act on those, those ideas? Mm -hmm. Do we have human beings that have the freedom to act on their ideas? Because we know that everybody's having ideas. Right, sure. And we don't know where those ideas are coming from, but they're, they're, they're all over the planet. Yep. And then our people, do they have the freedom to be able to act on those ideas? Mm -hmm. Prove that my idea is uh, a, a concept that I've proven, that's what we call an invention. Yeah. And then we take that invention to the market where it actually gets, we discover whether we've created value or not. That's right, it's tested. Right, that process of being able to, to, to have human beings that have ideas that are able to go to a market to see if they're creating value, that learning curve that George talks right. about, get people on the learning curve and see if they're discovering anything, creating yes. and discovering. If it's really creating value, then that becomes knowledge. And that knowledge is, is really the thing that, that we value, mm -hmm. is knowledge. And, and knowledge has this other characteristic that when, when I share it with you, I don't lose it. Yeah. And, it's and non rival, as a common right, say. Yes. Right. And it, we you both didn't can use have, it up. Yeah, both of us can enjoy it at the same time. Yep. In fact, when we do that, a lot of times we both are better off. That's right. We figure out something else right. to do that we wouldn't have thought of by ourselves. So you've got that process, and that's what Julian Simon also argued is mm -hmm. look, you've got these people that have this creative ability. If they have the freedom to create, they're going to solve these problems of, of the. Uh, you know, putting people on the boat, yes. you put more people on the boat, the boat's going to sink. Mm -hmm. And he said, one of those people, when you put them on the boat, they actually figure out how to make the boat bigger. Yeah, or build more boats. Right. <laughs> and we're making the boat bigger much faster than we are adding people to it. Yeah, yeah population is growing, sure. but our ability to actually create these things, create resources mm. almost out of nothing, it's, yeah. it's out of knowledge that we create right. them. That, that process is just just having this effect, we see it all over the place. That's terrific. And, and we like the idea of commodities because it was just, take a basic commodity, yeah, the, and, yeah. Yeah, a non-renewable one, That's copper. Right. Yeah, well, stuff we got a pretty good yeah. idea of, okay, in a sense how much there yeah. is now and how much we're likely to find. Yeah. So it's anchored in the material world. Right, we, yeah. we have this anchor in the material world, but also it's this idea, kind of a, um, intelligence that mm -hmm. we're applying to the material right. world that allows us to, to create value right. for one another. No, absolutely. And then markets let us figure out That's if we're right. really doing something. Because we still, because everyone might in principle have this capacity, like Steve Jobs, right? But right. he had been born and raised in Haiti, say, right. versus California, different social context, his capacity to create wealth right. and value would have been completely different. In fact, a great story with him, his father's biological father mm -hmm. was actually from Syria. Yes. So the question is, if he'd been born in Syria, what his, would his life have been like? Wow. And then what would our life have been like? Yes, if he had been, yeah, that's right. And then the follow-up question is, how many Steve Jobs are in Syria today? Yeah, no kidding. How many of these guys are all over the planet, yep. but the conditions aren't such that that seed can actually flourish? Mm. So that's the real question. Right. Can is we, how we, how, but human beings have a human nature, wherever they are, but they need particular social conditions to be able to create value right. to, to their potential. Yeah. 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 Good and stuff. I think that's, that explains why when people are given this added measure of freedom, mm -hmm. then this, then this thinks people become so. abundance creators. Yes. Great stuff. Gail yeah. Pooley, thanks for joining All right. me. It's good to be with you. All right. This is Jay Richards at COSM 2019.